Hello and welcome to the Quarterback in Your Life podcast. I am your host, Keenan Reynolds, joined today by my usual co-host, Mr. Che Mock. He was absent uh, last time we recorded. It's good to have you back, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hate that I missed uh, an episode and, and I will not continue that trend. I apologize, but Thanksgiving holiday got the best of me. No, nah, man, it's all good. It was a, it was a good conversation. Um, got some good feedback on it, um, you know, and, and now we can kind of get back to a little bit of a semblance of normalcy before we hit another holiday break. Um, but, you know, uh, a lot has happened, you know, since we, we last got on a call um, in the world. I mean, it's a lot of things going on today. Um, you know, we've had we've had vaccines come out. Um, COVID is tearing through the NFL. The world seems like. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, like you said, the world, but specifically yeah. uh, the NFL. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to me. You know, you look at the Ravens just because that's my former team. I I still kind of follow them from time to time. They literally don't. <laughs> they literally don't have a team. Like it's, I think they got thirty nine players on the active roster right now. Um, wow. It's pretty crazy to see uh, how that whole thing worked out. And I don't know if you read the backstory on how they think it may have come to pass. Apparently, uh, and we, we actually talked about the Titans. Remember when the Titans was like going yeah. through this thing a few a few weeks ago, and we talked about the same thing. So literally the same thing happened. One of the strength coaches who ended up getting suspended by the team um, apparently didn't report symptoms and it wasn't inconsistent with his tracking device and his mask wearing. And they think, no way to know for sure, but they think that he was a catalyst for um, all the positive tests. I mean, they went, I think it's like nine days in a row, eight or nine days in a row where they've had nothing but positive tests. So I think it's really crazy that like, you know, teams preach, you know, we got to, it's, we talk to our players, you know, you got to be diligent. You got to, you can't go out. You can't, you know, some people are sacrificing time with their families. You know, they have young kids. They don't even have their families with them. So they've been around. They went away from their families since training camp. <clears throat> and then you have, you know, reportedly, I don't know the facts. I'm not inside the building. But reportedly, you have uh, a coach who is supposedly like the patient zero inside the building that caused this, this mini outbreak. For me as a player, I'm pissed, especially if I end up testing positive because it's like, I've been working my working my ass off to follow the rules and make sure I play, get my money, support my family, keep my family healthy. And it was somebody being reckless. uh, That is the reason why all of a sudden now we're playing on a Wednesday instead of the Thanksgiving night game. And, you know, if somebody who is susceptible gets it, who knows what can happen? I mean, we're all athletes, um, you know, they're, you know, the top 1%. But you never know with this virus. So, I, I mean, I would be very frustrated if I'm a player and I kind of see this go down. Yeah, I mean, man, where to start? I mean, so whether whether or not people subscribe to science um, or the notion of the virus and the contagion and, and or believe that we should be protective or not, um, they are, there are layers of professionalism, I think, that we have to take into account, right? Yep. So you work for a private organization in a private league and there are protocols put in place so that the org- organization can function within the, the rules and the league. And so like, you know, as an employee, particularly as a personnel, like a, you know, example person, I mean, you think of it contributed to like an executive of a company, like you didn't want, you don't want your administrative and, and executive out there being reckless, passing it down to um, the staff and the employees. Right. Right. And, you know, in a corporate setting, right? And thinking about like, you know, quarterbacking in life, like, I mean, parallel this to a corporate setting. I mean, you know, the CEO, you know, the, the owner is, is going to be pretty mad and should be, right? Yeah. But, like, you know, the shareholders, the uh, um, shareholders being the fan base, being whether it's not like the season ticket holders or the, I mean, again, obviously, we, you know, we have limitations on who can attend games and it's an analogy, but, you know, yeah. the, the people who are out there paying good money, so that the TV and, and watching and giving viewership so that the TV rights owners want to be able to put the game on and then sell the advertising, et cetera. I mean, it has such a trickle down effect to where, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, not just your point of the players being mad, a lot of people should be mad. NBC should be mad. Yeah. I mean, right. NBC apparently. Costing them money. 
cost them money. And they had a, a Christmas lighting or special or something yeah. or another scheduled for Wednesday. Yep. I didn't really have much choice. I was like, all right, we play do we do we do we broadcast the Ravens and the Steelers? Like the yeah. tenor Steelers and the Ravens and Lamar Jackson and everything else. I don't know if Lamar's even gonna be able to play or not. Uh, I don't know if wants, yeah. So do we broadcast them or do we do the Christmas special that we <laughs> put a ton of money and investment into, right? Like yeah. there's not really much of a of a conversation that you have there, but like so you got that you got that layer of it. And then you got what you've pointed out, which is like that layer of you know, sort of internal frustration and bad examples and you know and i i you've seen the um you know you, you've seen what this has done to the, to, the, to the ravens in terms of players and being ready and everything else for the game but like imagine too you're the steelers and how upset oh, yeah. you are on their side of it the- well they had their own you know they they kind of like made a lot of i think i had saw some whispers on social media where they were kind of advocating for the ravens to forfeit mm-hmm but then the Steelers started having like our own little mini outbreak. So, I mean, you it, it's such an unpredictable thing. And, and I think that this conversation, we don't necessarily want to beat a dead horse because we've talked about COVID multiple times. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's current. And, and these are things that are, that are evolving in real time for us. And another thing that I think that kind of leads perfectly from, from that topic to the next topic, which is vaccine. Um, you know, there's reports that <clears throat> by January – a pending approval, of course, that, that, that there would be capability to vaccinate, you know, 20 to 30 million people per month. And there's estimates that say if 75 percent of the population takes a vaccine that is 90 percent effective or better, that we have a chance of completely. Well, I wouldn't say completely, but we have a very good chance of cre- of of building up herd immunity and, you know, getting back to normal life. So it's a very interesting and ironic situation that we're in for two reasons. On the one hand, nobody, I hate being in, I hate being stuck at home. I hate working from home. It's it's the worst. It's almost like a prison cell. I'd much rather be going to the office every day. Much rather have, you know, human interaction. So there, there's a lot of people that subscribe to that feeling. Where they're just like, man, I'm sick of this lockdown. I want to party. I want to go out. I want to be around my loved ones. I don't want to wear a mask. Blase, blase, right? But those same people, some of those same people are also, I ain't taking no vaccine. I don't trust the government. This is, the, you know, I, you know, vaccines cause this or that. And so it's like the, the solution is is imminent. You know what I'm saying? Like the vaccine is imminent. But the, the challenge is in order to get to a place where everybody wants to be, people have to trust the government and trust big corporations and take this vaccine. And I talked to my parents about it. I talked to my wife about it. And they're always, you know, both of them are like, nah, I'm going to wait, you know, I'm going to wait a little bit before I take it. And I've been really thinking about this whole vaccination thing, man. And I really think like by the time it actually gets to a place where I would be able to get the vaccine or me or you would be able to actually go to like a CVS and get vaccinated. Think about how many millions of people would have already received this vaccine. So in a sense, you're not really the first wave. So I don't really see a reason why you wouldn't take it. Um, I think, I think being in the military as well, I'll probably be required to take it because they require us to take the flu shot. And there's like all kinds of conspiracy theories on flu shots. And I've been getting them for eight years and haven't had any issues, knock on wood. Got a kid on the way, so it's not making me infertile. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, there's so many different things that people say about these vaccines. And I just think it's just a, a collective fear be it irrational or not, of like big government, big corporations. But I mean, I personally am to a point where I would be comfortable enough to say, you know what, just give me the vaccine. Like, let's you just know, get it going. It's like it's it's a it's a good it's a it's a good debate to have. And I think it at the end of the day, it 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 sort of comes down to sort of, in my opinion, um, where what your goals are, I guess. Right. I mean, like, you know, cause some people are not, they're like, I'm just not afraid of the virus. And I just, I'm going to go out there and live my life regardless. Um, is your goal to be able to have that collective thought and freedom of thinking that, you know, you're going to be, you know, your own dictator in terms of your health and well being, or is it normalcy? Like, yeah. 
and 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 the own, like being your own dictator of your health and well-being doesn't necessarily mean you take the virus it just means that you make the decision one way or the other and there's and the unfortunate reality is that like there's there's probably gonna be a lot of that crowd that wants to be that hey look i'm gonna dictate how how what my body puts in and doesn't government's not gonna tell me what to do yeah um i don't want that crowd though to be screaming and complaining about the right or the need to wear a mask right so like yeah can't have it both ways you can't have it both ways you can't have both ways. And I feel like I'm hearing, I hear sometimes that crowd saying that maybe, um, and I'm not going to speak to which crowd I'm in. It doesn't matter. But I yeah. feel like you're sometimes people saying, well, no, they ain't nobody going to tell me what I'm going to do. I'm freedom of freedom, freedom of body and rights. Yeah. But well, maybe then we need to get the virus under control. So I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that, you know, by the time we get to the point of, having a vaccination so readily available that it gets to, to us and myself probably being back further in the line than you because of your military status. Um, there's going to be a pretty strong level of herd immunity. In fact, I saw, and I don't remember um, the specific doctor, but there was, uh, it, it's one of the, I believe White House doctors that came out today uh, and not Fauci, but someone else in, in, uh, in tow with, with a level of respect that said one third um, he believes that one third of the U.S. population will have contracted coronavirus by by early January. I uh, believe it. I do too. I do too. Um, I, I'm surprised. Well, I, w- I would have been surprised five months ago. I guess I'm not surprised now. Yeah. Um, but knowing that, you you got to wonder though. Then, Keenan, do you think that 75 percent of that two thirds that's out there, and or you know 75 percent of that one third that's already apparently got it, like I mean, I don't know. I don't know if seventy five percent of people take the flu vaccination. I'd be one. I'd, I'd, I'd be dying to know. Well, they don't. I would say they wouldn't. I don't know the statistics. Um, but I mean, the, the difference is the flu is like you. You're. I mean, it, it can get. It can be deadly. Um, for, but for I'd say an overwhelming majority, even more so than COVID, like you hit, you take some Theraflu, you know, you you do your chicken noodle soup, you you down bad for a week, you come back. Um, me personally, uh, my view again going back onto the whole like the third you talked about the third of the population would have gotten COVID. so um actually i just came out of quarantine my wife tested positive um and so that was a pretty like hitting me home a little bit uh where it's like we we do the right things you know we wear the mask in public we, you know we don't we're not nasty people we wash our hands before we eat you know we're not in the clubs every night or every weekend and she still somehow got it i mean who knows where it came from? I have no idea. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, for me, I feel like I've done all the right things. And yet I've still, you know, me and my family are both, you know, exposed oh. and, and and could have had the vibe. I didn't, I tested negative when I did test, but, you know, I still, that exposure was obviously very immediate. So I'm like, it, what if, you know, I expose my dad who's high risk or my mom who's high risk? You know what I'm saying? Like if if getting vaccinated will pr- help protect those people, because clearly, you know, these measures are not 100 percent foolproof. Um, and we talked about it kind of like akin, uh, it's kind of akin to wearing a seatbelt in a car crash. Like you still might get injured, but you might not die. So yeah. like the way I see it is a vaccine is like, I don't know, it, it has to be an extra layer of protection that could even, you know, and, it, and again, it's more about protecting the other people around me than it is more so my own individual opinion but again don't want to beat a bit a dead horse on the on the COVID side but you know today i actually had a conversation with uh, a mentor of mine and this is somewhat related to kind of the pandemic as a whole um and i know chase probably sitting over there trying to figure out where i'm going with this because we we talked about a uh, thing but i told him that i wanted to just kind of muse a little bit uh in the beginning of this podcast less structure but this kind of came to mind and this has been on my mind heavy um, for a while. And we were talking and the question kind of came to like, I asked him a simple question, like, and he's probably gonna listen to this. So I'm not going to tell, I'm obviously not gonna say any names. I'm um, just want to let him know that what he said was very profound. Um, I asked him, I was like, so what do you do every day? Like it was the end of our conversation. I was like, so what do you, what do you do? <laughs> and, and we kind and he kind of went on and he went on a little bit of a tangent. And one of the big things that he said, <clears throat> as he described, you know, what he does, he was just like, at some point, you know, I've done very well for myself. And at some point, I kind of just sat back and, and asked myself, like, 
okay, I got all this, you know, I got all this money, got this, got that. But what, okay, and, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like uh, within this pandemic, it's caused a lot of people to have that moment where they're, they're like, now what? Like, I had all this success, had all this money, now what? You know what I'm saying? Do I continue to keep working harder to build more success? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, he was like, it doesn't necessarily bring a, a crazy level of happiness to me anymore. Like, the money is the money, but there are other things that are more important. And so for me, it was profound because I've definitely had those moments, I've had that moment often where it's just like, like, what's the point? Like that, I think the best thing about the pandemic for me personally, is allowed me to be very introspective on, you know, what is the purpose? What is my purpose? And so I kind of want to spend just a little brief moment, um, Che, and, and kind of talk to you and ask you about what do you, have you, have you had an enlightening moment where you were like, I found my purpose? Like, this is what I meant to do for life. Have you ever had a moment, you know, you, you're, you're, you're an entrepreneur. I'm sure you've had moments where you're kind of like, is this what I'm going to do for the next 25 years? Like, these are the questions that, that have, have been spurred in my mind due to the pandemic, due to being at the house, due to you see all the different things that have made life kind of like function, I guess. All the things that people, you know, enjoy kind of stripped away a little bit. And it kind of makes you sit back and think, OK, what's the point of all this? What am I doing? You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit upset with you that you didn't give me any rehearse <laughs> to, to prepare for this. Not that we go too far in depth in in, uh, in preparation for our our topics or our conversations. We do want to keep it real. We do want to quarterback the life and actually talk about stuff that relevant from the heart. But I I would have appreciated uh, having. You know, well, to be honest with you, that kind of came literally as we were talking about the vaccine and the coronavirus, I was just, it, that thought popped up and I was like, you know what, this is a very organic moment. Let's do it. Cause the conversations we've had offline about topics, we've often had our best, you know, debates and best conversations because they've been organic in the moment. And then we're like, all right, we're going to go talk about it on a podcast, but it, you just can't recreate that same thing. So I'm trying to, I'm yeah. trying to do that right now. That's what's up. And I like the direction and we got new spirit, new energy after Thanksgiving. So <laughs> I can, uh, regurgitate some of the, the, the turkey, turkey feelings that I have coming out mm -hmm. of my mind. Um, man, that's a that's a tough question. And, and it's posed in different ways. Have I ever had that sort of aha moment? Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't, I, so, you know, I recently, you know, I got, recently got 40 under 40 uh, in, in Nashville, um, mm -hmm. which, which for me brought to a level of presence of success and, and sort of realization that others see the success um, because I'm not out seeking affirmation. So getting that affirmation, right, of like people asking like for my TED talk, you know, like what would I say to a group or like people saying like, what's something that stood out to you that people have said to you in your life that you want to strive for? Um, what made you decide to start an agency? What made all those questions made me start to question my day to day and my my sort of trajectory. So it's really insightful that you haven't asked this because I've I guess I've had this thought process stirring up, but I haven't brought it to the forefront of my mind in so much as actually thinking of it into existence um, as a result of the virus or whatever. And so um, I do have a little bit of I guess food for thought based on some of the things that have been asked of me in the last three to six months. Um, I know that one of the things that drives me is helping people. And whether that is um, fundamental in terms of development or growth or um, in my practice as an attorney or as an agent or in my life as an entrepreneur or as a um, philanthropist. I enjoy, I get satisfaction out of seeing other people get satisfaction out of being engaged with me. And I think it's a part of why I've been able to have some level of success going out on my own and venturing into sort of sports like you, right? My whole goal in life is like, as an agent is to impress you or impress others in their circumstances to help you further your career and your aspirations. So for me, sort of at a macro level, I think it's to help people at the micro level. I don't know what drives me every single day when I wake up other than 
knowing that I have some level of autonomy and freedom and control, not, not as much control as I want, but I have a little bit as an, as someone in my position at a younger age, don't have to necessarily report to anyone. Um, that's a driving force that keeps me hungry and therefore makes me desirous to want to make money so I can stay in that position. Yeah. Uh, that's really important to me from a holistic sort of like, like what like satisfies me, like what makes me tick, what, like, what do I want to do? Like, I think it's so easy. And it's, it's, it's interesting that you say that the person you spoke to said that like making money was great, but it does it drive him. I think it's so easy for someone who has experienced success to say that. And I think maybe we should, you and I should talk about what that, why I say that and what that means, because like most people coming out of this pandemic really just want to make money. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. most people coming out of this is like, man, I'll do anything to have a job. Yeah. I'll do it. And so like their drive, their motivation, their satisfaction has been put upside, flipped on its head. You got mm -hmm. people, I got people like, I got a good friend who's a wedding planner who was like, I would do anything just to be able to throw a wedding or to yeah. just be able to like have like a guaranteed check knowing that it's coming in a month. Yeah. So, you know, like, I, but, but, so I'm going to, I'm going to digress, pause my answer maybe and think about it a little bit more, but ask you, Keenan, on your side, like, and think about the perspective I just drew in because you've experienced an, an enormous level of success at 27 yeah, years yeah. old. I mean, you literally have gone from being a Heisman Trophy candidate um, at, at a very young age, 20 years old, to having your jersey retired while you were in college, um, to then getting honored at numerous things and, and events, to getting Amateur Athlete of the Year to then playing in the NFL, to then playing in the XFL, to broadcasting for CBS, and now being and working for a large, um, you know, finance company, and you're 27 years old. So, yeah, yeah. and I know you got a birthday coming up in 12 days. Don't think I forgot. <laughs> um, and 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 so all that's happened to you. So like your 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 sort of idea of success has got to be so different. Like what drives you got to be so different? What does drive you? Like because I know how hard you work, and I think I know part of this this answer. Yeah. yeah. But in in reflecting on thinking about like how people probably perceive their day to day based on the things that have occurred in this virus, like what's your driving force? And I'll think about my answer while you're answering yours. Yeah, yeah so, so we got a leg go ahead. all right here we go um that's a great question covid really opened my eyes to a lot um so many people don't know and i may have touched on this in a prior a prior episode and if i did i don't forgot by now but basically when, once covid hit i was essentially going to go coach prior to like like right around that area right i, I had already accepted a job to go to ucla I knew that. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> um, and it was a done deal. I was gonna, you know, get paid pennies to work a hundred hours a week. And it was football. I love I was in my mind, I'm like, I love ball. I love I don't I remember distinctly telling my wife, I don't see myself doing anything outside of football. That's where I come from. That's where my mind comes from. And now here I am, uh nine months later, and to be honest with you, I've probably watched five games start to finish since in any level up until this point. Um, I don't really follow NFL news that much outside of like some of the big things. Um, and I, and I've honestly asked myself, you know, I spent like, it almost feels like a different life. Like the things that you just talked about, Che, it almost feels like a different life. And the question I, I kept asking myself is like, you did all of that. Like, so what? Like what, what my question has now turned from let me play in the NFL long enough to where I can make enough money to never work again to what have I done to actually like impact somebody else? Like that is my next phase of life. What can I do to help to challenge myself, to put my family, to set up a legacy beyond just, man, he was a hell of a player in college. And, and and bring it on to something to this person affected millions of people. I don't know if that is a narcissistic goal. Maybe somebody could say that's very narcissistic to think about. 
but I feel like narcissists to think about helping lots of people because from the standpoint of you're doing it for your own self satisfaction. But at the end of the day, if, if, if that is the case, if I'm helping millions of people because it makes me feel good, millions of people have been affected. And so it's a win in my book. Now I'm not saying I'm coming from that perspective. I'm just, I'm just countering my own argument, how somebody else could. Um, so I guess I'm saying all this to say, I'm kind of, you know, rambling on, but I think I just learned that there's more to life than ball. I always felt like I distinctly remember being in a therapy session when I was still with the Seahawks. And I told the lady, I was like, you know, if I don't make the team this year, I think this might be the end of my career, you know, like football be over. And I honestly don't know what that looks like. Like I was literally behind a wall uh, for the longest, for the last 22 years of my life behind a wall of athletics. And, and now that I've climbed over that wall and kind of moved on to the next phase, it's almost like a very sobering feeling. And it just makes me feel like I don't think you can attach your purpose to a specific thing, like an external thing. Um, because when I think about it, it's like, how can I attack, like, in what way, in what way would I be fulfilling my purpose by playing football? Like, it's clearly not the act of playing football that is the purpose being fulfilled. So what is it? It's something more than just that. And so that's kind of the journey that I'm currently on is like, it's, it's beyond just recognition. It's beyond money. It's beyond playing in the games. Like, <clears throat> What what else is there? Like it has to be more and it has to be something that is not attached to an external thing. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but, you know, I, I think about like when, when I see guys like on social media, like like, you know, we do all these you know marketing deals and you make you make the money. And it's just like, man, like that was that was a hell of a time when we were in the in the height of that. I mean, we had them coming in, you know, day oh, yeah. in, day out. Oh, yeah. But I, I look back and I just, or when I see it now, I'm just like, I don't know. I just don't have the same feeling that I did about ball. And I don't know if if I'm secretly bitter that I'm not playing anymore. Um, but I just think I've, I'm looking at the game from a very, very far place. You know, I'm not, I'm not tied in like I used to be. And I'm thinking about how can I, you know, impact the most people. Well, I, and look, I, I think. You, you 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 extrap well. I don't know if extrapolate is the right word, but I mean you 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 looked at what was driving your immediate satisfaction, football, and then you sort of extrapolated it to what drives you from a long term satisfaction standpoint, or you know where where did your balance come in? And it sounds like maybe a part of that balance with football was the fact that you were entertaining you were affecting people maybe in a different type of way, but I mean, you, like you, you had a cult like following when I met you. Um, and you know, you, you, you still do have a pretty high level following people, a lot of people who revere you, but you know, maybe that, um, that, that, that satisfaction, that personal feel and touch is lost because you're in an arena that so few get to experience and feel and touch and like actually engage with you. Maybe you felt like it was, being lost, like that, that ability to touch people has been lost. And now that you've stepped into the professional world, or you stepped into an arena that allows you to actually affect people, like by the things you do daily, potentially, maybe yeah. that, maybe that, 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 that helps sort of guide you and has given you that new perspective. I mean, um, I don't think it's at all looking at some of the things you said, I don't think it's at all, um, narcissistic or at least in my opinion, I don't, maybe in the, in the um, Webster's definition of narcissism, maybe there's, it, it could lie there somewhat, but I don't think, you know, in my understanding of narcissism, narcissism is one who's in love with themselves and, and, and seeks and gets enjoyment out of that love for self. I think if you find, fundamentally, if you find satisfaction with helping others or affecting others, and that's how you draw some level of, um, joy i think that's just the opposite i don't think you're a narcissist at all in fact i think you're um you're you're uh you're you're, you're an extrovert or and 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 a, a people pleaser um so you know it's it's interesting though like that's what's come about through corona right that you had that perspective prior to you wanted to be in football and coronavirus hit and you had to draw up your analysis now again 
I bring up the point playing sort of, you know, different side of the, of the, the, the perspective of saying, you know, a, a lot of people are going to look at you and say, well, you had, that was God given, like you had, you know, God given talent that puts you at the top of the food chain. Um, and they're going to think that you didn't work as hard as you did. Now I know how hard you work because I saw it, but other people are going to think, oh, well, but I mean, man, it's so easy to say that you just, you know, you're driven by different factors, but you played in the NFL, you were Keenan Reynolds, you know? Yeah. So, you know, another thing I think that would be interesting for me to take a look at and ask you, and I, I now know the answer to the question, my full answer, so, but I want to, I want to, I want to dive into your side would be to say, Keenan, if I stripped away the successes you've had and I stripped away sort of the background that you have, the mold, the, you know, sort of the, the experiences, do you wake up tomorrow and still do what you're doing today? Nope. I don't think so. Um, the the interesting thing about it, it's such a it's such a weird thing. And life is kind of funny like that, right? The successes for the longest, I would say the successes, um, the things that, you know, the, the, the notoriety, whatever, money, man, it's like a it's a drug. And you and you're just like you're almost addicted to it. And you almost become the uh you come to define yourself by said drug. Excuse me. But the the other side of that is dealing with it the right way affords you a network and connection that otherwise would would have to be attained by going to a Harvard business school or you know these are the things you have to do to get there. So this is what this is, and, and I'm I'm glad we're doing this undocumented session because I feel like this is gonna be the most unscripted, unscripted, you know, undocumented, unscripted. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> um, but I guess my I guess what I'm saying is uh, I'm either obviously. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, damn, I, I lost my train of thought a little bit. No, so unscripted because I think you were transitioning maybe. Or no, no, no. I, I think just basically what I'm saying is like those things offer you a network offer you you know opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be given i think my network is the reason why i'm where i am right now it had nothing to do with how much i knew because i don't know anything it had nothing to do with the school i went to it all had to do with the people i knew and that's just the way that i found th this world works right now um but the interesting part about it is i often think about people that aren't afforded certain opportunities that i've been afforded whether it be the Naval Academy or through the sports world or having so many people see me, see how I conduct myself on a public forum and then grow to liking me based on that and then want to talk to me and help me, you know, navigate through this, this business world or everything as a result. What about the people that the thing I think about, and maybe this is kind of something that I can fulfill a need for is I really, I really feel like there are kids, you know, that are trying to find their way to a better spot, to a better opportunity. They just don't have the connections. And because this world relies on connections, you know, that, that, that forces people to, you got to go to the best school. You got to go to, you know, a top school to get the best network, to get the best job, even though you might not necessarily be the best person. And we've also talked about that on our podcast as well. So, you know, I just feel like to answer your question, no way. I think if you strip all that away, if you strip all my successes away, the Naval Academy, I might have to do a couple extra things to kind of get where I need where I am today. I might have to go to business school to get where I am today. I just happen to know the right people and they like me and they gave me the opportunity. And now I'm just going to take that opportunity and use it to impact uh, not only my family, my legacy, but other people and make other people's lives better. I love that. You know, it, it, I want to speaking on like topics and stuff and, and maybe so I'm going to answer your question and then I'm going to make sure I touch on that. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the audience, the, free, the world, the, the, to, you know, the direction I'm going with this. So the original question about what, what drives me and I, I thought through as you were talking, um, that, that satisfaction um, of, of being impactful and seeing the residual effects of it 
is what drives me. So like I can, because I know I'd be lying to myself if I didn't say money drives me heavily because um, I'm in a in a circumstance to where I can't do the things that I want to do without having pretty significant income. Like I really enjoy real estate. Like I really like it. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to invest in it. And I really enjoy having agency. I really enjoy autonomy. But like, so the residual effects of helping people is what drives me. I think that's what it is. Because if I do it the right way, as an attorney, I can draw income from good legal representation. As an agent, I can draw income from good agency work. As a um, property owner and someone who rents to tenants, if I have good tenants, I can draw residual income from it. That helps people too. And then in the flip side, as a business owner, I can hire people. We've got people behind these cameras right now that work for me that I like having an effect on daily and seeing their progressions and their growth over the course of the relationship that I've gotten to know them. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's why I'm avail myself from a time standpoint when I don't really have the time to do it, but I want to be engaged in those people's growth and maturity. So all those things together. And then the residual effect of that is this or yeah. things that have been able to grow from the agency or from the things that I do on day to day, that that's, that's wow. Like, because I'm willing to do this, with this understanding that this is for the greater good of, of, you know, hopefully people, we're going to touch the masses and the residual effect of that's going to be great. The residual effect of making you as a client and someone who I, I really value friendship, relationship, brotherhood with the residual effect of that gives me a really great feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether it's monetary or otherwise, the monetary piece of that residual effect is really important to me. So that's, that's the answer to your question. So thank you for asking that question. To, yeah. And, and go ahead. And then I'm going to still want to, I, I got, I got somebody I want to bring up that I think relates to this question, this very question. And we can talk about how a life, you can see this person's whole life change exactly like we're talking about. It's crazy. And this person was in the news this past weekend and you might know who I'm talking about. I'll give you some context clues, but go ahead. Go and on no, no, no. Go ahead. I want to hear what you, what you're about to ask me. Okay. So let me ask you and see if you can, let's, let's play the name game. This is unrecorded. <laughs> we're going to see if we can, we should try to get this person on this podcast. All right. Who did you see this weekend? I don't know if you watched everything surrounding the person that was highlighted this weekend. If you watch everything surrounding it, you'll see this individual that I'm speaking of who was in the limelight in a sport this weekend had the whole world paying attention to him in the latter part of his career. Very, very latter part, if, if even still a career. Oh, you're talking about Mike Tyson. Iron Mike. All right. Now, <laughs> now you, we're talking about what drives you, man. I have never, I get a little bit of chills thinking about, I have never watched an inter, a post-game, post-fight, post-anything interview. Mm, mm -hmm. I know exactly what you're talking about. I saw with Mike, and I literally was sitting there looking at Mike like, man, like, I know this dude had a really, like, in my mind, I'm thinking, this dude had a really tough upbringing, or this dude had a really tough go at life. And through, and he admits it, through drugs or experimenting or whatever, like his mind has morphed into something that is not the same person that existed 30 years ago. Iron Mike is like soft, um, pillowy Mike, <laughs> bruiser and a yeah. boss. And like he did that post-fight interview and somebody asked him like, Mike, like, first off, you look great. Why are you doing this? And his immediate response, and there was no like, it was no rehearsal, no nothing. His immediate response was essentially, and I, I, I can't quote it because I don't remember specifically, but what I took away was essentially it was like, I know that I have a platform now where I can help massive amounts of people. I can have a, a major effect. I can give my money to charity. I can wake up every day and feel good about my life. And I was like, and, and then he, and, and, and he, he said it in so many different ways of like, and he mentioned it. He was like, he goes, and one of the things that was crazy, he said, I used to be driven by, you know, fast cars and, and money. And I think he said cocaine and, and like random stuff. Right. And he said, now, you know, I'm, I'm just worried about having like a nice suit, my pigeons and a little bit of feed. And then he said, That's funny. Isn't it? He's talking to the people. And then he said, my wife and my kids are going to feel different about that. When I say my, my pigeons and my, my suits and like, but Mike is so disconnected from all the bullshit yeah. that he's like, he's the realest, but he's had, that perspective that a lot of people can't and are not afforded. And it, it's almost going back to what your friend said, 
right? Like think of the analogy, your friend or your mentor said, hey, I've had it all, what really drives me? Mike Tyson was pound for pound, the baddest dude on the entire planet. For sure. For sure. And he got called up in a bunch of nonsense. He spent all his money. He, he, he got accused of rape. I don't know if he did it or not, but it, it occurred. He went to jail for it. He then came back. He got chastised. He had some weird stuff that happened to him. He had some mental breakdowns. And then he got fat. And then he <laughs> fixed he himself. Right, right. And he got bright. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. We need to try to get that man on the show. But, like, I don't know. Is it? Does it take, like, a reframing? to get to that point where you draw perspective? Because a lot of people wouldn't be able to say that. A lot of people are gonna say, man, what drives me? I wake up every day so I can have money. I wanna have money because I wanna have success. I wanna have success so I can have access. I wanna have access so I can have women or alternatively on the vice versa. You know, like people think very narrow-minded. So what does it take to get the perspective? Is um, it God? Is it is it is it being broken down? Like what, what is it? I think... I think what it what takes, it takes. is um, getting it. You have to get like, and if you don't have money, then yeah, you're going to wake up and be like, I got to get to this bread. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't have nothing. Uh, and then if you don't have a good, a nice car, you I got to get, I got to get the Hellcat. I got to get the, you know, the SRT. I got to get the Tesla. You know what I'm saying? If you don't have a lot of women in your life, like, man, I need to have, I got to have three, four, five of them in a week, you know, like th these are real thoughts, like, but then you get it, but then you can buy whatever you want and you can drive whatever you want and you can date whoever you want. And you're like, man, I'm here. I'm at the top of the world. This is it. And then you realize one way or the other, the realization comes where you're like, damn, like, this is what I want. Like, and I think that's kind of what my, my mentor was kind of getting across was like, I got all, like I got all the money and it's just like, it doesn't like, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't fill all the holes. And, you know, I actually, I think that, you know, one thing you said was God, I'm a man of faith. So I would say that, that, that is the, the, the cure all, you know, um, I, I truly believe that, you know, but at the end of the day, we always want what we can't have. And then when you get it and you realize it's not what it, what you thought it was, or it's not as good as you thought it was, Honestly, it's just, I really believe it's the, I think it's more the thrill of like chasing it than it is actually having it. And then once you have it, or once you, you know, like in, in Mike's case, we all know, see that what he's going through, but the amount of wisdom this, this that man has and how he's able to pass that on in his unique way, um, his mindset now, um, he talks about, he's not afraid to try anything. He'd rather fail than not try. Like that is a mindset that very few people have. Um, you know, without risk, there is no reward. Without pain, there is no joy. You know, without defeat, there's no victory. Like you got to have you can't appreciate one side if you don't have the other side. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, to gain that perspective, I think it takes having been there and like realizing um, that it ain't what it's supposed to be. And, and a great analogy is this. Think of a little kid, right? And you tell this little kid, don't touch the stove is hot. Don't touch the stove is hot. Don't touch the stove is hot. <laughs> And little kid looking at you like, yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you look away, what the little kid want to do? He want to go see. He want to see for himself that that stove is hot. And it's the same thing throughout life. You know, money not going to make you happy. Women not going to make you happy. Cars not going to make you happy. Well, I'm going to find out because I feel like if I'm rich, I'm going to be good. If I'm driving a nice car, I'm going to be straight. So I'm going to find out. And then you and then you find out that wow this person was right. But the only way you were able to really see that was to experience it. So a majority of people will never experience that. You know, overwhelming majority will never experience like pure wealth. But that's what people strive for. But at the end of the day, even if you never get to that quote unquote number that you have, you're still gonna be feeling like you're in the rat race. Like you're still gonna be like, I've been waking up every single day for the last X amount of years with one singular goal and that's money and i finally got to my goal and then it, either one or two things happen either it's not enough you need more money or you realize i just wasted so much of my life focused on money or focused on material possessions 
And that just goes back to the main thing that I was talking about as it relates to purpose, as it relates to your purpose cannot be tied to anything external because I've been there and it does not work. And it's going to leave you a victim of, of outcomes and circumstances. And it's a battle that I still fight to this day of not being, you know, at the mercy of things going my way or not going my way. You know, that's, that's a tough, that's a gamble. I mean, you really, you're rolling the dice, you're flipping the coin every single time you live that way. So if you can find contentment within your own body, within your own, you know, confines of yourself, then, you know, you I pursue ball because I just love the team. I just love working hard. I just love the process. You know, I, I pursue business because I love starting businesses that change lives. Like you said, I love being able to affect people through my business. I mean, that's what's going to make you wealthy. That's what's going to make you rich. If you were just like, I'm going to buy as many houses as I possibly can just for the sake of flipping those houses, you might be successful for a little bit. But at the end of the day, that I don't think that that is a strategy that is sustainable. I think the sustainable strategy is you enjoying the process of what being an entrepreneur does. And for me, it's what does the process of learning about all the things that were otherwise hidden for me and then revealing that information to people that it's currently hidden from now. So that's my long spiel. You know, I, <laughs> this is uh, this. First off, that's quarterback in your life. right? Now. <laughs> Like we like that's some knowledge deep. You hear it here first, America. It's like you pushing those external factors. Like you're not going to find satisfaction, and that's it, like there's so many things we could draw on. I, we could write a book about this. But you look at some of the most successful people on this earth, and what are they? They're philanthropists. You know, they're they're like they 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 become you know. You see a level of happiness, and I don't. And we we we've talked politics on this show before. We've talked um, so many various levels of people and broken down like sort of how people are. But like, you look at like, and I'll use someone like Bill Gates as a random example. I'm going to use a bunch of like contrasting examples of like what I think is like a happy person versus a maybe a deeply sad person that we didn't realize was deeply sad. But you look at a Bill Gates who's extremely rich. And you don't really hear a lot about him. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about him. Maybe that he and 5G created the virus or who knows what. But um, there's real talk out there about Bill Gates. I mean, the, the facts are, from a practical matter, the man is a, is a genius who has created an immense amount of wealth. And he just gives it most of it away if he can. Um, now, our country is set up in foundation where you, you benefit from a tax standpoint when you give money away, when you're making lots of money. But the Bill Gates of the world. Um, and then I'll use... You know, like some of the unhappy people who I don't know if they're happy or unhappy, but like I look at like an Elon Musk who like is not afraid to show you he has all those things and he's still young. But like you hear like wild, crazy shit about Elon Musk and like you see these like crazy tweets while he's high and like you watch some of these conversations and like you're like, yo, like what's up with this dude? He's got like two hundred billion dollars in the bank. Like, how can you be this crazy? Um, but is it because he's looking at things externally? What's driving him? Like, he, he maybe he's driven by money. And then I think maybe I'm, I'm and I'm not like I would love to be Elon Musk. And I think that dude is a genius, and he has an amazing company. And I hope he give me a Tesla for talking about him. <laughs> um, but you look maybe in the middle between the Bill Gates and the Elon Musk at the time now, no longer in the middle. But you look at, say, then let's use um, what's Amazon's founder, um, Jeff Bezos. We talked about him last week. Did y'all see? Yeah. And so, you know, and I was I was, you know, in a coma eating turkey. But you look at Bezos and I, he's he's like somewhere in between like Bezos, like he's he's a philanthropist and, and Musk may very well be too. I don't know, proclaim to know a ton, but he's also still out there sort of loving life, right? Like he dude beefed up, he's swole, he's, he's got a regimen, routine, you know, he's got, you know, whatever. So, but you notice that these people progress and the older they seem to get, the more charitable they seem to be, the more they, they probably had it and realized I don't need it. What can I do to benefit others? And so, 
maybe if we can give people a lesson from this podcast, from this one, and I love the way this one went, is try to draw the perspective early and often. It'll be hard to do if you've not been at that point of success. Um, but one of the things in my TED talk when I was asked um, what I what what advice I've been given or I would give to someone um, when approaching a task or approaching work. And I said, and I've said, and I've been told at some point in my life, it's to approach every single task like it's the most important task of your entire life because you'll leave a good impression on the people you're working with. And those people will then have a favorable thing to say about you. And, you know, there's that saying, it's not um, what you know, but who you know. Well, that's false. I'm telling people right now, it's fundamentally false. It's not who you know. It's who knows you on a favorable basis. So if you treat every task like it's the most important task for your entire life, then the person who you did the task for knows you on a favorable basis and knows probably 10 other people. And so for you, Keenan, that translated into people thinking and knowing that you're a good task doer because people saw it in how you translated it on a football field. So you were given a platform differently, but you still had to work to get the level of success. And then when you got in the door, like you said, the door was open and you've been afforded the opportunity because of the successes you had as a football player and or as you know an, an individual too, but a part of that success. So your door was open differently, but you still had to work really hard to get the door to open just in a different respect. Mm -hmm. And all that got given, so on or whatever, so be it. But it's still success. And that's what translated into this new world. And now, because you've had that success and you've seen what can be afforded from that success, you're saying, okay, where do I internally draw satisfaction? And so I would say, man, gosh, like, I wish somebody would have asked me that question. Like, where's my internal satisfaction? And I think one of the things you touched on I'm a spiritual person as well. And I think having, I think this is why maybe God delivers some perspective for people because it allows you to internalize and talk to yourself. When you're talking to God, you're talking to someone else in the room that's not really in the room, right? He's always with you, right? But you have to draw a perspective and understanding how you're walking in his light and that's, I think, why, for better or worse, we won't go into that right now, but I think maybe that's why a lot of people who have walked in his path have some level of perspective of what is driving them on a day-to-day. -day. And that's why maybe people who have lesser income streams, they've drawn that perspective, whether it be through religion or whatever. They've drawn it early. And they said, you know what? I can be a community worker and make nominal income because my I've, I've already drawn that perspective that success is internalized differently so yeah. you know what do you think you think that i mean that's a yeah i i think i think the the thing about success that that is so hard to learn and and it's a daily battle for me and i'm and by the way like as, as much as i'm like we we talk about this and we preaching like i'm really preaching to myself because these are lessons that i'm still trying to figure out but in my again I have a lot of time where I just be in my head wondering, like, you know, what, what's this mean? What's that mean? I think we like the people you talked about. I don't know if that would, that's necessarily a lot of people. I think at, at the end of the day, like you said, etern internally, they are content with themselves. They're content with, hey, listen, I'm doing something that I enjoy. It's not about money for me. It's just about being, you know, the best me I can be. You talked about making sure every task is done like it's the most important thing in the world. You know, I think when you can reach that level of focus, of of attention to detail, of contentment, when you can read and, and I'll, I, we can finish on this point right here. When you can reach contentment. I feel like you have reached success when you can get to the point where you don't need like you, you like not necessarily saying like, all right, I'm content. I'm just going to retire, hang them up. But you don't wake up every day saying, man, I got to get this. I got to get that. I got to get this new car. I got to get, you know, I got to get that extra bonus. I got to get this. If you if that is your mindset, you have not reached a level of contentment. 
in my opinion, in my unqualified opinion, when you reach contentment, that means you wake up every day saying, how can I be better at whatever I'm doing, whether it's business, sports, like I'm just going to be the best me today. And if I'm the best me, I'm going to take whatever comes and I'm going to be content with whatever comes. And and when when you are your best you, you are supremely focused. You are um, in the moment. You are drawn or driven by internal pieces, internal factors. And then that in turn, in my opinion, all of that is wrapped in a box called contentment. And that is success. And that is something that I've yet to obtain that I have no idea how to even get there. (laughs) I'm figuring it out just like everybody else. But from me to everyone who listens, in my opinion, find contentment. There it is. There it is. I bet you find, uh, I bet you find it when you have, I bet you, I bet you, I bet you, you, you become more, it becomes more clear when you have a child. And uh, yeah, man, I'm excited. I'm, I'm hype. I really, and, and that's the thing that, you know, my mentor would talk about. He's just like, man, I just love, he, he always talks about it. I love spending time with my girls. You know what I'm I think it's a beautiful thing. I'm excited. Um, you know, I have, that'll be my motivation. That'll be why I wake up in the morning. Make sure she's good. You know, I go do my best. I go do what I got to do. Not because I want some fame or glory or some, you know, whatever. I go do it for her. And it, it may not even happen like automatically. It might, that might be a, a, a process you know, I don't think she's gonna come out the womb and I'm be like, all of a sudden, you know, I'm on this, I'm on this type of time. I think I'm just gonna be excited to have her here. I'm gonna be excited to be a dad, um, and raise and raise my babies. There it is, man. I, we, I guess, I mean, we, 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 we can, we there. We, 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 we yeah. Can, when you asked that question, man, you put us on a three. <laughs> we weren't ready for. I've been, I've been, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Like, you know what? I just kind of want to talk like let's just talk let's not have like a direction and that's kind of what i was trying to i was trying to hit it before we started recording i'm just like you know let's, I, we, we we do have topics we want to talk about we want to talk about real estate that is really big um it's relevant in my life right now um uh, you make a living off of it it will be a topic possibly next week no guarantees but <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless i do feel these type of conversations are, are needed because of the authenticity off the top of the dome, you got to speak from the, from the heart. And we've had these conversations before, just never had them recorded. So boom, we got it here. We up against our time. We appreciate everybody that supports us and listens to us. Um, we're back on the, we back on the consistent train with dropping episodes. We're not going to fall off for a couple of weeks like we did around election time. And uh, this is quarterback in life podcast signing off. <laughs>